choose to focus on one or two <coughs> issues during the year of the presidency. And when Tony Blair had that role, he chose health inequalities as one of the major focuses of his presidency. And as part of that, he commissioned a couple of big pieces of work on health inequalities in Europe. And one of them was um, commissioned from Professor Johan Mackenbach from the Netherlands. And he was asked to look at the state of health inequalities and health inequalities research across Europe. And what he said was that the UK had the longest and strongest intellectual tradition of studying health inequalities, and in fact, had the longest tradition of policy trying to address health inequalities. We'd had more white papers, we'd had more green papers, we'd had more NHS changes, we'd had more directives. But he concluded that it hadn't made a blind bit of difference. Across that time period, health inequalities had not reduced. In fact, they'd increased. And so despite our strong intellectual tradition, and despite us trying to do things about health inequalities, we haven't yet managed to marry the two, to bring together our research and our policy and practice to really make a difference. Now, I'm a social epidemiologist, and you will all know what that means, but when I'm on airplanes, nobody knows what an epidemiologist is. They either think it's skin diseases or insects. I uh, don't <laughs> quite know where they get the insects from. But, you know, social epidemiologists, we study the social determinants of health, things like class and inequality and education and income and social context. And we've done well at that, I think. It's a growing field now with a you know, strong empirical evidence base. And what I think the last probably half century has shown us is how important the social determinants of health are. <coughs> we know so much now about how low social status itself affects health, working through the biology of chronic stress. And we know how social affiliations affect health. Our friendships, our social networks, social capital, social support. And these are really strong influences on health. I mean, if I were to take all of you tonight and ask you to write down on a little piece of card how many friends you've got, and then I divided you into a group with four or more friends, and a group with fewer. I'm sure that would be a tiny, tiny group in tonight's <laughs> audience. And then I gave you all the same dose of cold virus. Those of you with more friends would be far less likely to contract a cold than those of you with fewer friends. And if you were to allow me to give you an experimental wound, just a little scratch, okay, and then wait to see how it heals, those of you who've got a good relationship with your spouse, your partner, um, someone close to you, you would heal faster, significantly faster than those who don't. So we can see through both our social epidemiological research and the kinds of experiments that allow us to explore the pathways, how powerful the social determinants of health are, and how powerful they are throughout life. We're learning more and more about how the social environment affects women while they're pregnant, their children while they're very, very young, families as children develop, and how those early influences, those early social influences on children have effects on life across the life course, right up through middle age and into older life. So we've learnt a huge amount about how psychosocial factors affect our health. And my own research has been focused very much on, on the more macro influences on those social determinants. What does it do to a society? What does it do to us as individuals to live in a society that is more equal as opposed to one that is more unequal? And what we've uncovered are profound 
strong influences on health and social well-being in rich developed countries that are more unequal than others. So a huge body of evidence. So why are we so bad at turning that into something useful, something we can do? Part of it's to do with scientific standards of proof, what we think we need to have as a body of evidence before we can act. Professor Ted Schrecker, who, a Canadian who's now at the University of Durham, wrote recently that we should not expect um, within the social determinants of health to see the kinds of evidence, the kinds of proof that we would see if we were looking at a toxic cause of a cancer, <coughs> say the relationship between smoking and lung cancer. We can't expect that kind of unequivocal evidence. And if we wait too long for it, then we'll never act. And yet there was a recent meta-analysis, um, you know, a big overview of lots of research studies looking at influences on mortality. And in that meta-analysis, the effect of social affiliation, of having friends, of having social support, was as strong a predictor as future mortality as smoking. So actually we do have strong evidence. And of course, we're able to look at a whole body of evidence and put the pieces together. We can't do one great big experiment and, for instance, experimentally change the income distribution of the UK, although I would love it if we tried, um, and hold another country's con constant or raise it and then see what happens. <coughs> but we do have a body of evidence. We have time series studies. We have experiments that start to fill out the pathway. We have longitudinal studies. We have a vast body of evidence. We have enough to act. But it's very, very difficult for us to do so. Um, I'm just going to pull up a few slides. <coughs> Because I have been working with a group convened by the British Academy to perhaps try and um, bring the research, the ideas about what can be done into public health practice. And the report that has been produced by the British Academy, which I hope will be released in December, but certainly early in the new year, um, is aimed at helping local authorities think about what they can do to reduce health inequalities you know, within the powers that they have. And the group was asked to do this by Sir Michael Marmot, who wanted the British Academy you know, to look at practical things that could be done arising out of his report on health inequalities for the last government. And what we decided to do was to completely avoid behavioral interventions to change people's health-related behaviors. We know that it's not good for people to smoke or drink too much or not exercise or eat too much. We have an evidence base around changing those health-related behaviours. We can significantly change them, but not very much. And anything we do that's related to health behaviours doesn't change the root causes of why people adopt those behaviours in the first place. So we decided to ignore that aspect of the creation of health inequalities and focus on the root causes. And instead of trying to do something very difficult and comprehensive, um, we were a little bit lazy. We just asked a number of people, if you could do one thing to reduce health inequalities, what would you do? Um, and I'm going to share with you very, very briefly the answers. They may provoke, <clears throat> you might want to respond to them when we're sitting on the panel, but they are all ideas of what local authorities could do. Um, I drew the short straw and was asked to write a, a chapter as well. And my part of the report um, is suggesting that we need fairness commissions more widely across the UK, primarily to work towards a living wage that all employment should be compensated by a living wage, which will both help to reduce health inequalities, boost the economy, um, have a lot of spill-on effects. 
Professor Edward Malhuish wanted local authorities to focus on early childhood education and care. This is probably one of the least controversial of the suggestions. You won't find much disagreement across the political spectrum about the importance of early childhood and care. Professor Danny Dawling, I think, surprised some of us by calling for 20 mile per hour speed limits for cars in residential areas by shops and by schools. As he pointed out, speed limits in local authority areas are under the control of the local authority, and all you really need to do to change them is to take a pot of paint out and put twos over the threes in areas that currently have 30 mile per hour speed limits. He points out the enormous inequalities in um, deaths and injuries um, related to car accidents. These do predominantly affect the poor and predominantly affect poor children. He makes a very convincing case for the reduction in health inequalities we would see by that one simple measure. Claire Bambra at the University of Durham focused on tackling worklessness through actually improving health. In a way, it's a sort of a, a backwards way of doing things from how we normally do things. We normally try to tackle worklessness just by focusing on job skills and interviews and trying to get people into work. And she argues that actually, if we want to do that effectively, we need to tackle the underlying health concerns that people have who are workless first, and perhaps particularly mental health concerns. Kwan McKenzie, who's now at the University of Toronto, was previously in London, suggested that local authorities, and in particular health and well-being boards, adopt participatory budgeting as part of the process by which they allocate resources. And in participatory budgeting, well, it's just like it sounds, you actually get the community involved in decision-making about how resources will be spent to reduce health inequalities or improve health. Not only might that shift the balance of how resources are spent, but he argues that the process itself is empowering for individuals and communities, improves mental health and improves social cohesion. It was his number one pick for how to improve mental health in communities. Tarani Chandola and Andrew Jenkins from the University of Manchester proposed resources being spent on lifelong learning. That we need to think about educating our populations throughout life. Um, this chart's a bit complicated and I don't have time to spend on it before Gareth starts waving at me. But what it shows is that even if you leave school without any qualifications, if you gain them later in life, your mortality risk is reduced compared to people who don't gain those further um, qualifications. So lifelong learning um, can be helpful to people across their life course. Hal Kendig and Chris Phillipson argue for age-friendly communities, communities that are both physically and socially safe and rich and well-resourced to allow <coughs> elderly people to move around, to communicate with one another, to participate in the community. And James Nurse Rue from the University of Manchester argues for using the power of public sector employers to raise employment standards and reduce inequalities, which is somewhat connected to my own proposition around um, the living wage. He particularly feels that this will help to reduce inequalities in health between ethnic minorities and the majority. Members of ethnic minorities are disproportionately represented in the public service as employees, and improving work conditions there could be particularly beneficial for them. And last of all, my own colleague from, from the University of York, Professor Alan Maynard, says basically do whatever you like but evaluate it. Make sure it works and make sure it's cost effective. If it doesn't work or it's not cost effective, don't do it. So those are just some ideas. They're ideas from people who've been thinking a long time about health inequalities and the social determinants of health. 
None of them have to do with health services, the NHS, or health-related behaviours. They're to do with changing the social context, changing the social determinants themselves, to give more people a better chance at well-being throughout their life courses. For myself, I found it hard to think of ways to translate um, my passion to reduce health inequalities and my academic research into something more practical. Rich and I founded the Equality Trust in 2009 to try to both educate and campaign. But you know, it's a, it's a tough road and it's hard to make those connections. <coughs> Meetings like this are extremely helpful because we do all need to be educating ourselves, thinking about it, thinking of new ways forward, networking with one another, trying out solutions, you know, having thought experiments, thinking about what we can do next. And the more we connect, the more we can do. Because it's no good as academics sitting in our ivory towers and coming up with this long, strong intellectual tradition of knowing what is right and knowing what is wrong if we can't communicate it and if we can't convince people to act on that evidence and make change. Thanks. Thank you. Great. Hi, everyone. Um, so my presentation follows on very nicely, I think, from Kate. So there's a few bits I'm going to skip over because Kate's already made some of those points. So I, I'm from the University of Edinburgh, though obviously not Scottish, as you can tell from my accent. Um, so I thought I'd start with, a, as my background picture, I have this image of Edinburgh, which kind of merges together the old Edinburgh and, and the more contemporary Edinburgh. And I did that because I thought, you know, as we've been hearing, health inequalities are this problem that are just really seem to be intractable, incredibly persistent. So despite all these massive changes we've had in society, we've still got health inequalities that are really similar to the ones that we had over 100 years ago in terms of who's affected geographically and socially. And what I'm going to talk about in, in this presentation, the main thing I'm drawing on is something that's a little bit similar to the British Academy project that Kate was talking about, which is where I've tried to ask researchers working on health inequalities for a long time. What is it that you think we should actually be doing to tackle health inequalities? What are the policy proposals that you think will be successful in reducing health inequalities? Um, so I'm going to um, talk first of all a little bit, little bit about where people that I've um, talked to in interviews, and this includes policymakers, advocates, as well as researchers, think we are at the moment. And a little bit about our commitments to evidence-based policy and using evidence in the policy process. Then the main part will be focusing on this, what is it that researchers think we should be doing, and then a bit about how we might go about achieving those kinds of policy changes. So in terms of where we are at now, and this data comes from um, 112 interviews that I've done with various different people involved in health inequalities and um, research and policy debates. And um, I think, as, as Kate underlined, there's a sense that we've got this <coughs> mass of great research in the UK there's quite a lot of frustration and pessimism around at the moment, I think, in terms of thinking. We had all this great research, we had quite a long opportunity since 1997 to try and reduce health inequalities, and we didn't get very far with that. So, so why is that? Um, people kind of working at the more political end of policy making were, were often basically express their frustration. They felt that researchers weren't giving them really specific policy solutions that they could campaign around. And I think that's something that's probably starting to change. Um, civil servants, um, there was a bit of debate amongst civil servants about whether we actually had reduced health inequalities, particularly in England, um, by some measures, I guess some civil servants felt that they had, they'd done quite well in reducing health inequalities. Um, in Wales and Scotland that was different, um, people tend to emphasise the fact that in uh, um, devolved kind of settings we don't have the powers over and control over some of the key things that we know are determinants of health inequalities. Um, in terms of the academics, they uh, kind of express this concern that Kate touched on, that you can't really do research evaluating the kind of big macro policies that you might like to see if those policies aren't being tried and put into place. So they're expressing frustration with the kinds of policies that we've seen. And I think there is now a desire to start getting a bit more imaginative about how we might um, address that issue. Um, 
if in terms of the people that I spoke to locally, and I, I think that is is quite an important point and something that maybe health inequalities researchers haven't always focused on as much as they could have done. Although I think it's it's a bit different um, in Wales and Gareth and Ava have. But it, there was a, there's a lot of sense that researchers don't necessarily always kind of use what's available in terms of the communities that are around, kind of working with communities and listening a lot more to what they think the problems are and what they think the potential solutions might be. So that's a kind of sense on, on where we are. So a lot of pessimism, but um, I think one po very positive thing is I think in public health there is this real interest in and acceptance that evidence is important. But also, as Kate pointed out, there's this kind of mass of evidence on mental health inequalities. It's growing on a weekly basis. I know um, this image here looks, looks a lot like my desk sometimes looks. <laughs> it looks a lot like actually what a lot of the policymakers I spoke to, they, they were complaining about. They they're getting sent evidence all the time, so the problem is not that there's a, a lack of evidence, or indeed a lack of interest, but it's what to do with all this evidence. And so, yeah, in, in public health terms, and I think it is different in, in some other policy areas, um, I, I don't think we have to worry too much about this kind of um, uh, joke that was <coughs> kind of has been talked about a lot about by my colleagues working in education um, and immigration, for example, of this idea that government policy is, um, should be anecdote-based, or just is anecdote-based rather than evidence-based. But I then also think there's this um, kind of concern or... Uh, that was raised a lot amongst the academics I spoke to, that our commitment to evidence-based policy in some ways may be holding us back. And, um, and that's because of this uh, sense, as this research and policy advisor says, that so many of the things that are likely to work for health inequalities aren't projects, they're big policies. And so we're waiting for someone to implement those policies before we can evaluate them. And in the meantime, we have the situation in which, um, so this is an academic who's describing going to a presentation with a very senior academic, um, who basically gave a presentation um, where they were showing something that, that this academic was saying, you know, it has to be to do with the nature of British capitalism. It's not plausible, really, that it's about a single policy. <coughs> And then all of his recommendations are at the micro meso level. And that's when he was asked by someone in the policy audience to give specific policy recommendations. So they're all resilience training or how to get good managers, which is just woefully different from the level of changes we've seen in the rise of the problem. And I think that's something he, we kind of have experienced repeatedly in health inequalities. It's this ongoing problem of lifestyle drift, which has been really widely talked about, David Hunter and colleagues and, and Hilary Graham, where we, although everybody accepts the upstream macro factors are important, very often you get re recommendations that start to move downstream. So I was kind of thinking, well, what's, a, what's an alternative approach to still having um, evidence kind of informed policy discussions? And I think one approach, and it often is taken in policy settings, um, is very similar to this British Academy project, where you basically gather around some key experts, you bring them around a table, so rather than trying to systematically review the evidence, you talk to people who've really been thinking a lot about health inequalities over long periods of time. Um, now, there are some issues with this kind of approach, um, and one of them is, um, I don't know if you have this experience, definitely have it in Newsnight Scotland, if you turn on the telly and there's some expert talking about public health, and you think, why the hell are they been asked to talk about public health? <laughs> they know nothing about it. Um, and then there's also this issue, and, and on the previous slide um, I was showing you, it was, it was a group of experts who were invited to the Scottish, uh, into the Scottish Parliament to talk about health inequalities. Um, and you, you, I mean, I won't go into the details of it, but you did get a really quite tense um, uh, debate between some of the academics involved. And obviously that's not very helpful in policy terms, because what you get is a kind of a, a, a real sense that there's just a lot of uncertainty within the health and policies field. So what I set out to do was to uh, do an online survey that researchers could complete anonymously. Uh, that was asking them to... Um, say which pol policies to reduce health inequalities they thought were likely to reduce health inequalities. So I gathered together 99 policy proposals by asking people to researchers to suggest things and also by reviewing suggestions that are already out there in things like the Marmot Review. Um, and, and then 41 part researchers kindly participated in the first part of the survey because it was incredibly long. And basically what I asked them to do was to evaluate each of these 99 policy proposals three times. One, based on their expert opinion. Two, based on their sense of the strength of the available evidence. And three, based on what they thought in the current context the health and equalities research community should be supporting. 
And then there's a second, much shorter part of the survey that more researchers participated in, and that was asking, I took the top 20 proposals from the first part and said, how extensive do you think the impact of these policy proposals will be? So um, those are the three questions, as I said, that I asked in the first part. I'm going to focus on these two, because I think that's the most interesting contrast. So how people answer, researchers answered when they were asked to answer purely on their expert opinion, and how they answered when they were asked to focus on the strength of the available evidence. So based purely on expert opinion, what you see here, and, I, and I've colour coded them, so blue, for example, relates to things that are public sector services, including the NHS, and yellow relates to more economic policies. So you see here, these um, top 10 proposals, there's really a lot of agreement amongst the 42 researchers who, who answered um, these questions that these things would reduce health inequalities. And they're very much about upstream policies, changing the kind of environment in which we live in. So the first two obviously are very economic, so um, having a more progressive system of taxation and developing and implementing a minimum income for healthy living. Um, and then we've also got increasing the national minimum wage down here. There's a, there's a bit about targeting um, public services and then there's a little bit about early years and targeting that. So very much about changing the environments in which we live. When I ask people to answer based on their sense of the strength of the available evidence, you can see uh, there's six um, purple rows here. So purple relates to changing uh, policies to change lifestyle risk factors. So there were none in the previous one, six here. That, so around tobacco, for example, um, <clears throat> uh, and there's also one on fluoridating domestic water supplies. So a key message really is that academics answer differently when they're asked about their expert opinion compared to their sense of the strength of available evidence. And th there could be a number of reasons for that. I also think when they're asked on the strength of the available evidence, the, um, the consensus is, is a little less strong than it was on, in, in terms of their expert opinion. There's also this recommendation that Kate mentioned that Diane Dorling had reducing speeds in, the, uh, in urban areas. In the second part of the survey, what I did was I gave people 100 points and they were asked to distribute those points according to which, which of these top 20 they thought would have the most impact on reducing health inequalities. Um, and what you can see here again is that the top 10 proposals are all these kind of upstream things about changing people's income and the services available to them, targeting some of those services. So if we look a little closer at these, again the top one is, is having more progressive systems of taxation and the second one developing and um, implementing a, a minimum income for healthy living. Um, uh, and then it's all about kind of things to bring down costs, some of them are targeted and um, provide better services, some of them are targeted, some of them are population wide. If we come back to the full list and focus on the bottom ten, this is where the things related to lifestyle behaviours and reducing those risk factors come in. Now, I want to be clear that I'm not saying in this talk that that doesn't mean that those things are important for health inequalities. And I think it's interesting that, that the things that have made it into the top 20 um, that are around changing those risk factors are still relatively upstream things. So they're things that are like um, changing the price of, of products um, and introducing standardised packaging. So they're not about health education and health promotion. Um, so yeah, just to... That, that's the kind of main point I wanted to make there. Because I gave this presentation before, and then I think I, I came away afterwards, and from the feedback I got, I think I'd given the impression that I therefore I didn't think these things were important, which I definitely don't want to say. So if this level of consensus really exists within the research community around health inequalities, what should we do with it? And I think these things are difficult, these kinds of upstream um, things, and, and policymakers can't do them if they haven't got a public mandate to implement them. So I think we need to think about this kind of, in terms of translating our passion in, into action, we need to think about evidence-informed public health advocacy. And there's been a bit of talk about, about that recently in health inequalities. It's very strong in tobacco control, so Simon Chapman's written a lot about it, and these are the kinds of things that he pulls out as being key things that you need to do to be a successful public health advocate. So have clarity and consensus around your objectives. You need to bring a coalition of relevant actors to the table. Think about the multiple entry points from which you can influence policy. You need to discredit your opponents and, and their ideas. And I don't think that's an interesting one for health inequalities because I don't think we really pay much attention to who is influencing policies in ways that kind of widen health inequalities. 
need to be strategic and opportunistic and employ evidence-based um, ideas persuasively. So if that's the case, if we were to take this route, then I think we'd need to start developing more specific policy recommendations. Um, and I think there has been a, a little bit of shyness amongst some health and equality researchers to do this, because they're not really economic researchers, and some of these recommendations require them to go beyond their, their kind of disciplinary training. But I think things like this British Academy project are starting to show that health and equality researchers are starting to do this. I think we need to identify who we need to be engaging with. And, and the key thing that comes up again and again is that even if civil servants or even ministers are really persuaded by the evidence, if they don't think the public or the media will go with it, then they're not going to do much with it. So we need to think about who it is we're trying to engage with. And that's probably not, um, not just civil servants. Then we need to start to kind of develop a coherent advocacy coalition. And this came up again and again in interviews when I was asking people who's lobbying on particular public health issues. Everyone's very clear who's lobbying on food and who's lobbying on tobacco. But when it comes to health inequality or social and economic inequality, there's no big lob lobby for tackling health inequalities. And it was often contrasted with tobacco. So in tobacco, there's a clear kind of advocacy community, researchers and advocates working together, and, and that's kind of lacking in health inequalities, or has been. And if you think about all these different groups who might be engaging in, in advocacy around health inequalities, the only one that was consistently mentioned in the interviews that I've done really was um, researchers, and, and they are obviously dependent on research funders. And it's quite difficult, I think, for researchers to engage in advocacy. It can have impacts for their, on their credibility. It's not something that all academics are comfortable with, and, and academics can be quite critical of one another when they see their colleagues um, doing things that they consider to be advocacy. And this is a, an interviewee who's a, who's a public sector researcher actually reflecting on this, saying they absolutely consider themselves to be an advocate, but that's not what they're paid to do. So it's a very difficult kind of balance that they have to tread all the time. Um, but f finally, I want to say, you know, I don't think that by suggesting that we need to get more involved in advocacy means that we need to take our eye off the ball with the evidence at all. I think advocacy is, tends to only be successful when you've got a really strong evidence base, and we've seen that around tobacco. So I think we need to start thinking about what would be the evidence base, how can we develop the evidence base further, which is massive and strong already, in ways that will help us. I think we need to get better at thinking imaginatively how can we um, analyse the impacts of upstream big policy shifts when we're maybe not seeing the kinds of policy shifts we'd like to see in the UK context. But we are having a kind of experiment in the welfare cuts that we've got at the moment and I think that's something we will be able to develop a stronger evidence base around that. And there's also international examples. I think we need to do more to work with and listen to communities in our research. And also, I feel very strongly about this, having done some work on tobacco industry influence, we do need to get better at identifying who's promoting ideas and evidence which kind of run counter to health inequalities and starting to challenge some of those ideas, what you might call researching up. So thanks very much for listening. Um, I'm thinking about contemplating doing a slightly larger um, kind of survey that tries to look at the bigger community interested in health inequalities. So uh, NGOs and people working in policy. If anyone was interested in doing that and being involved in Wales, I'd be really keen to hear from you. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Um, and uh, I, I'm sitting here um, having been asked to pick up from the uh, mass of evidence that we've heard about tonight saying, so right then, what are we doing about it? And um, over to you, Ruth, to sort this out. So that's the, the framing of the question I was given. Uh, so how's this going to work in practice? So I want to reflect a little bit on where we are and then talk about some possible ways in which we try and take uh, the use of this evidence in, in, into practice. Um, but I'm sitting here um, reminding myself of, of the uh, the experience I had 17 years ago when um, for the first time uh, in a place I worked in the north of England um, I, I was in a meeting like this big hall of people public meeting and uh, I was with the local authority and for the first time uh, the health authority and local authority launched their health plan and the reason it was the first time is because it started with tackling inequalities it talked about poverty it talked about housing education and this was called the city health plan and uh, this had brought the agencies together. 
and we were delighted. Because if you, it, I think we have to remember how far we've come. Uh, I, when I first went to work uh, uh, in uh, Liverpool in 1991, some of my team said, "Oh well, you know, well poverty is not really talked about, and you know, we don't really work with the local authority, and it wasn't really in, in the lexicon at that time." So 1996 it was, and um, uh, we launched this thing, and we were really pleased with ourselves. You know, this really progressive stuff, and we're doing really, really well. And a member of the public in the audience uh, stood up and said, um, how long is all this going to take then? And we, we said, well, you know, it's a long-term agenda, health for all, all this sort of business, um, 10 or 20 years, you know, big shift and so on. And he very simply said, uh, I haven't got 20 years. And I have to keep reminding myself, this isn't a theoretical experience. This is daily life. And what I took away from that 17 years ago, and what gets me out of bed every morning, is the urgency with which we have to make progress. Yes, we don't have all the answers, um, but our obligation, I think, is to remember this is people's lives that we're talking about. So um, I share that with you, could, uh, partly to explain why I've stuck with uh, this issue and, and wrestled with what to do. I twinned up with them when Michael Marmot was doing the report for England, uh, I said to him, can, can we twin up as a region? Can we sort of twin with you in some way? Um, and we didn't quite know what it meant. But what we did was to try and work alongside the emerging evidence and say, well, how would you try and put it into practice? What are the things that we could do differently that might take the evidence further forward into practice? So I'll reflect on that um, uh, in, in a minute uh, as I go through. So what I want to talk about then um, is using the evidence and uh, an outline of a possible approach. So. We've got lots of evidence, you've heard much of it tonight, the life course, uh, the absolute importance of the early years, uh, I don't think there's many commentators now who wouldn't agree with that, uh, but also that there are actions you can take right across the life course, it's not to say it's exclusively a matter of, of um, early years. Um, but there are roles for communities as well as individuals, so the social support systems, social networks, critical part of that and that governments can play a key role in the policy context that we set. Um, so the question, the burning question is, so how? How do we do all of this? I'm just going to quickly reflect on where we are in Wales. Um, the uh, headline story is that uh, life expectancy is uh, increasing uh, overall. Um, and interestingly, the um, life, healthy life expectancy for men and women is now 63 years. So. Uh, the gender difference is, is sort of catching up on healthy life expectancy. Um, but we all know, and I'm not going to, to dwell on it too long, you know that that inequality persists, not only in longevity, but in the period of time spent in poor health uh, across, across the social um, uh, spectrum. And, and that's um, well understood and a clear focus uh, for all of us uh, working in Wales. And looking at that life course, um, we can see, if we get behind the uh, lifestyle issues into the context of people's lives, if we look at the proportion of children living in uh, households below the average income, uh, if we, in middle years, if we look at the workplace, if we look at uh, the opportunity to be healthy in work and be healthy enough to be in work, um, we look at the reform of benefits, we see challenges there too. And then we know as we get older, there are issues such as fear of putting on the heating, fuel poverty, um, and the context, you know, when would we have found out um, that loneliness was a major cause of poor health and well-being? And, you know, thankfully we did. And thankfully we have got into the understanding that goes beyond the medical diagnosis into that social context. Um, so we've got challenges right across the life course. So where to start? What are the issues? Um, many threats. Uh, coming towards us, if you like, or with us now, that make it a complex picture. It's not a static picture. We think you know, the pattern is static, it's not, it's changing. The factors are changing in their balance. Um, this is taken from um, the latest uh, Michael Palmer report, which is for WHO on the European report on social determinants. And uh, I was uh, fortunate enough to be at the launch in London a couple of weeks ago. Um, listening to Michael talk about you know, the passion and the urgency to, to take action. So I thought, well, I'll take this um, latest analysis 
and look at, does this help to guide us? Does this help to sort of start to focus on the areas where uh, we might be able to, to make a difference? And uh, the analysis on the life course, I think, is now gaining quite a lot of traction that we think across the different age groups rather than individual behaviours or individual lifestyle issues. Um, the wider social context, social protection, um, increased interest on co-creation, uh, and then the macro and system level things that we need to do uh, to draw attention to these issues, to measure uh, and to uh, drive change. Um, I did <coughs> foolishly, some people might say, uh, when Michael published his first report for England, I did summarise his 200 um, page document uh, into three words. Um, and quite simply, it's about people, it's about places, and it's about power. And I think we have to talk about all three. And I was fascinated um, to hear uh, colleagues speaking at, at the uh, launch of the European report talking about empowerment. And I think it's a challenge for us as the uh, um, academics, the civil servants, the uh, policy makers or influencers. Um, how do we talk about power and share power uh, in a way that enables people to take on uh, the concept of co-creation. So I'll come back to that as an issue. So a possible approach. Um, in Wales, we have lots of assets. Um, we have a strong track record. Um, we have incredible commitments to this agenda. Um, and we have a health system that um, is in integrated. So can we build on that? Well, what about the long history? So I've taken the on the left the, the European report recommendations and said, well, where are we? Where have, we, have we been working on some of these things already? And some of you will disagree um, in terms of things we've picked out in terms of the history of what's happened in Wales. Um, but we do have a, a history of collectivism. We do have a history of cooperative movements. Um, and we have incredible um, uh, leaders and role models to Archie Cochrane, Julian Tudor Hart, and many, many more. So, you know, this isn't a new agenda for us in Wales. It's many of these issues have been uh, pertinent for a long time. So what are we doing now? Strong policies. So where are we? Well, actually, we've got quite a lot of stuff lined up here. Um, if you look at early years, we've got uh, programmes called Families First, Flying Start, um, huge commitment to the Healthy Schools programme. We have a corporate health standard. I go to awards events listening to businesses in Wales talking about what they do about health and well-being for their, with their staff, not for their staff, with their staff, and how it influences their um, bottom line, the customer satisfaction, absences, and so on. So there's lots of stuff going on um, around, around some of these issues. If you look at the wider um, action, uh, I'm personally uh, responsible across the Health and Social Services Department to the Deputy Minister for Tackling Poverty on <coughs> my, the department is doing to help on the cross-government policy on tackling poverty. And, you know, it's very clear, complete set of actions, I'm expected to make that contribution across government, cross-government policies uh, on these key issues. Um, uh, an emerging agenda on health and wealth. How are we using the health pound to create wealth? whether it's through science, education, innovation, um, but also in my recent report talking about um, have we create, can we create an economic sector grown out of creating health and well-being? So really coming in at, at that other government priority which is growing the economy. Um, and then in systems, health in all policies, we have uh, legislation, Active Travel Act, um, looking at creating conditions where people can enjoy the opportunities for uh, walking and cycling. Um, we have uh, a drive to have health in all policies and discussion around a future generations bill. Again, opportunities to lay the conditions for creating um, health and wellbeing, not just now, for in the future. So there's a lot going on. Um, and uh, a clear sense of purpose around a lot of it, so in terms of policies. But um, we know that the, that's well understood across the whole um, if you like, spectrum of what we need to do. And I just wanted to, before I move on to so what do we do about it, a couple of quotes. 
Um, we held a public health conference in Cardiff, some of you will have been at it, um, in October. And the First Minister opened the conference. Um, we had European colleagues there and all sorts who were immensely struck by the power of the, the political voice of Wales, saying um, actually how important this agenda was uh, in, in, uh, for the Welsh Government. Um, and a real strong sense that the solutions were in cross-government cross policies. So the context is there. Um, and the Health Minister spoke afterwards as well, two, two contributions. And uh, again, <coughs> signalling that um, shift in the way we think about the role of the health system in its broader sense, um, creating the environment for public health to work well, conditions that enable us to look at what's creating the poor health in Wales, um, and moving from educational interventions through to the, what's underneath it, what's behind it, echoing what Kat and, and, and Kate have said about, you know, it, it's not the lifestyle issue, it's what's behind it that we need to understand more. And, and a, a sense of direction, it's talked about moving towards a health service. So really powerful statements. So I'm sitting there thinking, right, okay, <laughs> uh, right, well, the policies in one of, you know, we've got legislation that's helpful, um, we've got commitments. Um, so how do we do it? How do we frame what we need to do in a way that's really going to drive this change, not just now, for the next generation? So I've drawn on the uh, World Health Organization stuff on Health 2020. We talked about whole of government, whole of society. So does that give us a way of trying to frame the evidence um, it, to make it into things that we ought to be doing. And, uh, I mean, I think if you look at the whole of government, and well, I hope you've, you've sort of um, picked up from what I've said, is the aspiration and determination is there. Um, there are strong linkages, and they're growing strongly by the day, across portfolios. Not only am I accountable for um, a contribution to ta tackling poverty, I'm also accountable for um, making sure our early years contribution plays in across uh, the government programme on that. Um, so using health and all policies, using the Future Generations Bill, um, clear accountability and the Silk Commission as an opportunity to look at what other powers might uh, come uh, to be in control uh, in Wales and could usefully take this agenda forward. So framing our conversation around that. <coughs> but what about the whole of society bit? What can we do to um, line everything else up as well? And um, this uh, picture uh, actually is a product of some of the work we did when we were sort of twinning up with, with um, uh, Michael Marmot. And we, we did an open space event. Uh, several hundred people with a waiting list wanted to come and talk about health inequalities. Uh, members of the public, third sector, professionals, all sorts of people um, really wanted to engage with, so what does this mean for us? How are we going to do this? This is a slight variation, I've sort of evolved it slightly, but out of it came a sense of, actually, we've all got something to do here, but we need to be clear what it is and how we might go about it. So um, this tries to capture some of that. Um, I don't know if we've been clear about businesses and organisations, you know, very clearly linking it to the economy and what the, the business world can do to help tackle the inequality story. Some great examples of how uh, uh, we, we might develop a better understanding, selecting perhaps the living wage issues, well-being at work, supporting people at work, and so on. The second area is how can public services work differently? Um, do we tend to um, decide we have an intervention, a service, I don't know, I'm going to pick any particular one, a preventive program, and we go out and we draw people into the program of work that we want. Um, do we need to think differently about how we work with individuals and communities to create a holistic response? Um, some of you will have heard me say, you know, I got to the point some years ago when I thought, well, if I'm living in a difficult social context, um, I might need my quit smoking service on a Monday and my alcohol reduction service on a Tuesday and counselling on a Wednesday, weight management Thursday. We've got to the point we've reduced it to so many individual factors that we've missed the point of um, uh, you know, the, the lived experience of someone's life. So have we, have we, do we need to change the way we think about the preventive interventions? Yes, I think we do. Um, doesn't mean we don't do some of those things, but 
take on the co-production concept, we start in a different place, I suspect. Um, third area, have we maximised what the health service can do? Um, uh, you know, the phrase is making every contact count. But actually, um, is that embedded yet? Probably not. Had we moved to a health service, a really prevention-focused service? Lots to do there, maybe. Um, the fourth one is um, the growth, I think, in understanding around asset-based community development. Um, we, there are great examples around of uh, starting uh, alongside communities, not diagnosing the deficits, but looking at the strengths <coughs> of those communities, and developing the way of working, which is about being an equal partner, co-production being the, the sort of phrase to do, capture some of that. And I think, again, the whole of society approach would be that we would work, all of us would work differently uh, if we adopted some of those principles. And then finally, uh, one of the things we found quite helpful in the previous role was how, how do you make it personal as well? So what would I do differently? If, um, and instead of being, you know, the usual advice about lifestyle behaviours, actually taking the mental well-being, um, five ways to well-being evidence, and turning that into individual actions. Because part of that is actually giving to other people. One of the five ways is giving. Second one, learning. Uh, ways of actually uh, building in a social response um, to um, individual health improvement means you actually give to other people. And you start to create virtuous circles then. So have we done enough to build that way of thinking about what makes me healthy actually helps somebody else be healthy too? Because I need to connect, that's a social thing. Be physically active, more likely to do it if I do it with somebody else. Uh, keep learning, probably need to do that with somebody else, possibly. Um, take notice, uh, live in the present. And finally, um, uh, keep learning, uh, giving rather. Uh, so, you know, can we use that framing of um, social creation of health to make it personal? Um, I, I throw these ideas out as ways in which we might be able to uh, mobilise action. So the themes. Um, I think uh, relentless, uh, focus on prevention and quality. You know, the bottom line is we, we have to make sure that we're measuring and focusing on the things that the health system does. We need to look across the life course now and bring the package of things together more. Um, and so that we don't do individual interventions, we, we put them in the context of people's lives. And then the third theme is this concept of all together for health. This is a shared thing that we create together. Um, and that therefore we need to work in a way that supports co-production. So what assets do we have? Well, one of the things that we're actively working on with colleagues in Public Health Wales is the over 50s health check. Um, and that's evolved and evolved. It started off as a straightforward health check concept. But it's evolving, and I think its potential is to really start to get more towards health literacy in the broader sense, um, and more of a public uh, shared space around um, opportunities for health and well-being. So it's early days, but in terms of shifting the system, uh, that might be one that uh, I think has quite a bit of potential. The other one is, um, Julian Tudor Hart um, published his, his paper in 1971. And we're actively working now with two health boards to say, can we really embed what he said? into practice in primary healthcare in Wales. Can we do that? And uh, with two health boards, I think at least one of them is represented here tonight, um, to really drive that agenda. Can the health system, and I noticed one of the evidence points was the role of primary healthcare, can we really develop a concept of primary healthcare, a way of working that's going to um, address needs? And then all together for health, co-production. Um, and I think co-production means lots of different things to different people. Um, uh, in fact, the Thousand Lives program um, today launched a toolkit about it, so um, there's a, a useful reference point there. And it can be anything from co-producing health in terms of the individual clinical conversation through to designing services in a way together, right through to asset-based community development where you start with first principles in communities. Um, the, the, the essence of it, as you, as you will know, this audience will know, is that equal relationship. You know, and the old adi adi um, adage is um, professionals on tap, not on top. Uh, you know, how do we uh, reframe how we work in the way that empowers people? That question of power, 
comes back in, in uh, the way we think about things. So, a way forward then. Um, so we've got policies lining up, um, legislative frameworks uh, and opportunities. Um, picking out some of those things on the themes of people, place and power, um, this is how I'm trying to capture the things that are happening at the moment that might be the promising ways of taking the evidence base that we've heard about and trying to make it real in the way that we do uh, the, the work that we need to do. So it's not just what, it's how we do it as well, I think, that matters. And then finally, and I wanted to echo something I think has come out of uh, all the presentations, uh, is something about the public discourse about this. So if we think the policy is lining up, we're trying to line up the services and programmes and interventions in a different way, what are the people saying about this issue? And um, I've just picked out some random uh, bits of, of um, pop, uh, commentary, if you like, just to provoke the conversation. Uh, and I, I'm very taken by uh, this is the people's health. You know, this is putting the public back in public health. Um, so um, some thoughts. Uh, this is come, this has come. There's two of them actually uh, from the social attitudes survey. Uh, the first one that um, nearly a third, or just over a third, thought the welfare state encouraged people to stop helping each other. Although this has now come down uh, since uh, 2010. And the second one, 15% of the population think that the welfare state is the most amazing uh, Britain's proudest achievement. So. Have we positioned social protection in the public discourse uh, effectively? It echoes some of the points that we made earlier. The second comment was from Michael Marmot himself, uh, from his press release when he launched the European report recently. Um, a real sense of determination and focus on that uh, children, young people, uh, the start in life. So do we take the broad approach, or do we capture the essence of uh, the, the sort of evidence around the early start in life. And then finally, a quote from a report um, which was from the Northwest. It was a piece of qualitative research with families in the Northwest who are living in, in uh, the disadvantaged communities. Um, and a sense of the uh, isolation and the priorities when you are worried about paying the rent or heating the house. Um, and then somebody else wants to talk to you about your health and well-being and your lifestyles. Um, there's a sense that we have a different conversation then, have we understood that? So, um, to summarise, the, the, the slide is about saying, um, where's the public conversation? Where's the public conversation about uh, making this real, about understanding? And I, I, I would slightly challenge, I'm sure we'll come back to your questions, um, the issue of professionals advocating. Um, if we're really about co-production, it's actually about working alongside the public we serve to address the uh, long-standing inequalities that we must urgently continue to do something about.